Hello and welcome to another episode of the Saints FC podcast. My name is John and sat to my left is the illustrious Mr. Tom Parker. Hello Tom, how are you? I'm good, thanks John. How's it going? Yeah, not not too bad. Um, things have been worse in the past, Think things have been better in the past. You, you know how it is. It's It was ever thus. I don't think they're going to get better <laughs> very, often, very soon to be honest. Um, so for those of you watching on YouTube, you'll notice that um, Tom and I <laughs> are sharing one yeah. microphone today. So uh, you may see it here an occasional pause as I hand the mic over to Tom. Um, as always, um, with the Saints FC podcast, we do love you getting in touch. You can email us saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. Quite a lot of you have been doing that and I'll get onto a couple of emails um, from people. Also, um, we still have our offer of a free crate of beer. Which we've been taking advantage of. <laughs> well, we've got to, sorry, got to get used to this. We've, we've definitely been taking advantage of. And um, those of you who've enjoyed the uh, Saints podcast and drinking a bottle of wine with us, um, today we're drinking some beers from, from Beer 52. Yeah. Um, Tom, tell us about what you're drinking right now. I have got this quite wonderful Boyne uh, Irish Craft American Pale Ale. It is, uh, I'm, you know, my... My proclivity is normally wine, but this is this is really nice. It's actually a genuinely tasty brew. Yeah, I've got a pretty tasty one here as well. This one is um, uh, the White Hag from the Irish Brewing Company, an Irish IPA. The White Hag, there we go. <laughs> nice name. Uh, delicious beer. And you know what the best thing about these beers is, Tom? Was the price. What price did you pay for these beers? I paid £5.25 for beers, snacks and magazine. And I've still got the snacks. We need to have the snacks. Yeah, so, so basically it's the £5.25. That, that's... The delivery, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you can get your free box of 10 beers, I think it was, or eight beers um, with your snack, your magazine. And all you have to do to get your free box of beer is head to www.beer52.com forward slash saints. The forward slash saints bit is very important. That's how they know that you want a free box of beer and not that you want to pay £24 for one of their boxes of beer. Um, you have to sign up for one of their subscription services. Um, which a subscription service, which is a box of beer every month, uh, which could well be to your tasting. You might want to taste out the beers. Uh, but this offer is absolutely free, and you can call them up and cancel your subscription at any time if you want to. So I, I think it's worth, definitely worthwhile making taking advantage of it. What, eight pound, five pound for eight beers and a snack and a magazine is unbelievable value, and, and delivered to your door as well. Yeah. Um, there's another thing as well which I'm I'm going to promote, which is an evening with Matthew Letissier on the 22nd of March at Revolution in Southampton. Um, what I will do is I will post a link to the event on Twitter and in the show notes. Um, so you can head down to Southampton Revolution on the 22nd of March and have dinner and drinks and an evening with, with, you know, let's face it, the one of the greatest football players the world has ever seen. Without the, without shadow of a doubt, the greatest. The, the greatest footballer, sorry Messi. Um, <coughs> uh, they do like loads of loads of different events where you can go and see um, footballers talking. They've even got uh, one with Paul Gascoigne in Bournemouth on the the fifth of April, which could be quite a good fun one as well. Anyway, so let's get on to the Saints focus stuff. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of correspondence. Uh, I'm going to give shout outs to Graham Cop, Brinley, Salakin, and Daniel Crouch, who've all em emailed in. Um, but I'm going to go straight to an email from Nate. Degago, I don't know if I've pronounced that right. Sorry if I haven't, Nate. But um, Nate says, Sorry guys, but I disagree with you on the Liverpool match and particularly your sentiments about their quality. Don't get me wrong, Salah, Firmino and Mane are very, very good players, but the rest of the squad is suspect and definitely beatable. My main issue is the pride of the players. If I was James Will Prowse, Tadic, Bertrand, Stevens, Davis and Long, I'd be busting an ass not to lose to Liverpool at home. I'd be putting 200% and do everything in my power to win. We're in the effing relegation zone and playing a club that has taken over half our squad in the last four and a half years. Um, if that doesn't motivate you, then what will? Where is the pride? That's in block capitals. That's why I'm emphasising that. Um, Teams like Burnley would have definitely have given Liverpool more of a game. Uh, he also adds, I don't rate Carigio. He's not good enough. We paid 19.2 million for him and he hasn't scored. His touch is terrible, average in the air, and he looks out of his depth. 
And he also says the promised transfer was unforgivable. We're in a relegation strap and we're still haggling for that level of quality. Goodness me, I cannot stand our board. They do my head in no communication with the supporters, constantly selling our best assets. The behaviour is just a recipe for disaster. What are they thinking? Uh, again, block capitals. Mr. Gao, show me the money. P.S. Thanks for the beers, by the way. Oh, and my Hoiberg nickname is Drumroll. The Great Dane, like the killer. I like the Great Dane. I mean, there's a there's a lot there, isn't there? Um, where should we start? Pride. I I think this pride thing is an interesting one because um, it's one we'll we'll come to in 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 a moment in other games. Um, I don't know whether they're allowed. To, I, it's almost like they're not allowed to show pride and passion. As I was I was watching a great clip that, and this is again, the club has to do this. Stop putting the really <laughs> good times on Facebook. It's very irritating. But of um, when Calvin Davis in 2012 played the world's best uh, game by a goalkeeper, uh, and I, there was there was a great moment where he does one of his saves, and Fonte, who I know we're not allowed to talk about, but turns around and he kind of grabs people, and I think you see Schneidlin as well, who's like, you know, grabs the rest of the team and tells them to concentrate. We kind of don't seem to have leaders. So I, th I think pride is almost a step on from having leaders. And I think we, at the moment, we're completely lacking in any form of leadership. I t yeah, I, d I, d I definitely agree that we seem to be lacking a leader on the pitch. Um, Bertrand being made the team captain. I mean, he, he does seem to have maybe the most leadership qualities, but he's not like a natural born leader like a Klaus Lundetvam or like you're saying you know Jose Fonte grabbing players by the collar and saying you know you've got to act up you've got to sort yourselves out um interestingly I mean at the weekend we saw Marco Nautovic getting very angry with lots of the other Stoke City players I don't know if that um you know demonstrates the right sort of leadership but it, at least it showed that he cared and you know he was really trying to work hard I mean I, I, I agree with you there, Nate. You know, basically um, what Nate is picking us up on was the fact that we said that Liverpool were just almost better quality than us in, in every department. He agrees with their front line being brilliant. And getting on to that, Carigio, we paid £19.2 million for him. We sold Sadio Mane for £30 million. Sadio Mane to £30 million looks like quite good value for money for Liverpool when you compare what we've paid for a striker who still hasn't scored an I mean, you had a stat that maybe he'd only had one shot on target since he's joined us. I I read that he'd had the the the, the very good chance he took against uh, West Brom and Ben Forster did a really good save was the was maybe one of or maybe two shots he's had on target. I did I I don't understand why we bought him. I, I genuinely don't. He does he is he really that much better than Sam Gallagher? Um, he's definitely by the looks of things not a goal scorer in the Charlie Austin mould and Charlie Austin is coming back is in training now so could be back on the pitch in the next few weeks is he even going to get on the bench Charlie Austin um, it's a very strange transfer to me we, we we're desperate for a player that scores goals he seems to work hard um, but I don't I can't quite work out what he is he doesn't seem to win many of the aerial battles like you'd expect him to do um, he is quite tidy um but I think, you know, John, you will want to talk about maybe the only time we've maybe seen what he he can do was against Burnley. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get on to that when we have a quick look at the Burnley game. <clears throat> but the goal that Saints scored, um, you know, came from a beautiful bit of link-up play between Nathan Redmond and Josh Sims. And then uh, a cross into the box, which Carige did really well in knocking it down to Gabbiadini and Gabbiadini putting it in. And you say, you know, what is a Carigio? What What's his point? I say he looks like the perfect striker for the big man, little man, 4 4 two formation. But, it, I mean, it's abundantly clear that Pellegrino doesn't want to play two up front. So, it, I mean, it does seem bizarre. Um, I, I don't know necessarily about his quality. I don't think we've used him in, in the way that perhaps he would want to be used. Uh, much like with Gabbiadini, there's there's no question about Gabbiadini's quality, but if you'd only seen him play this season, you'd probably have the same questions about him. Um, Tom, I wonder if you have some thoughts on the you know the promise transfer and you know the lack of the reinvestment of funds and us haggling over over money if if that's what it was that made the transfer fall through. I, d I mean it's very difficult to play players that play in Russia. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a great guarantee of quality. Um, particularly coming to the Premier League, coming to the Premier League in January when it's hard for players to adjust. I don't know if a winger was what we needed. 
Like, I genuinely don't. I don't think we needed another tricky, skillful winger. We've got Redmond, we've got Sims, we've got Buffal, we've got Tadic to a lesser extent. Um, I don't know if that was, you know, the the magic bullet. I think the magic bullet was a was a really good goal scorer and a goal scorer that if we are going to persist with playing this four three three four five one formation that we are, are obsessed with, that brings out the best. And I, I don't think it was a winger that we needed. I think we needed. I think we needed a, a leader at the back, and I think we needed a, a, a top, top quality forward. Now, realistically, we were never going to get a, a top quality forward in the January transfer window, but I, I think the promise thing was dangled in front of fans to show that we are doing something. We are desperately working behind the scenes, but really, if they wanted him, they'd have got the extra five million, they'd have found it, and um, if that's what it was all about. So, yeah, I don't think the promise was the magic bullet. Okay, and then the last thing from Nate, which I think we do need to talk about is, um, well, thanks for the biz. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, cheers for that, Nate. Um, the Hoiberg nickname, the Great Dane. What do you think about that? I think Peter Michael's lawyers might have a couple of things to say about it. But why not? He's the, he's the best Dane we've got. You know, he is the greatest Dane we have. So, yeah, let's go with it. But again, he can't get on the pitch. Yeah. What's going on there? It's so strange. Um, it, it, it's, it's very strange. I think you know we'll come on to the team selections uh, as as we move on to talk about the two matches that that we've had. So um, Burnley won, Saints won. Um, this was a game that uh, I was only able to see in part. Um, but Tom, you, you watched pretty much all of the match. I wonder if you want to give us your lowdown and your thoughts on you know perhaps the approach to the game, how we played in the first half, second half, and then um, you know what happened after. Ashley Barnes put Bernie in the lead and we actually started to make some changes and, and go for it a bit more. Well, I, it, The weird thing was, and I think it shows the quality of the Premier League and not in a positive way, was that Burnley was seventh having scored nine goals at home the entire season. Um, they looked like a team bereft of confidence, Burnley. Uh, they don't have a natural, they never have a natural forward player and they had lots of injuries. They had Ashley Barnes up front. Um, Saints started off pretty brightly, but it's the story of the season, and to be honest, we could have recorded this, um, you know, maybe after the Swansea game and just replayed the same thing. We just lacked cutting edge. We lacked any real chance creation, and we didn't really look like we had the passion, and we didn't look like we had the confidence or maybe the license among the players to put Burnley to the sword, which is what any other team would have done. They'd have recognised Burnley were weak, were lacking in confidence, had far from a full-strength team out there and would have really killed them. And we just seem unable uh, to do that, whether it's the tactics that are preventing us, whether it's the lack of belief. And we couldn't do it. And only in the second half, really, when um, we, we started to, to make some substitutions, did we come alive. And I think, and I, well, really, the truth be told, only when they scored did Saints look like they actually were interested in. And I think the goal was kind of a, a microcosm of Saints' season, which was a... You know, good cross, decent save, but their guy wanted it more. Ashley Barnes wanted it more than McCarthy, and that's no, you know, McCarthy's played exceptionally well. He wanted it more than our centre backs, and he got there first. And it, it was like it was Saints all over. Um, and then we switched it around. Sims, yeah, he, who we are big, big fans of on the podcast because we like him. He's direct, he, he gets results. And he, you know, it's a really good cross. Carrillo doing maybe what Carrillo is meant there to do. And Gabby Dini, you described the goal earlier, John, as similar to the ones at Wembley. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing that I've noticed about Gabby Dini is he seems to be exceptionally good in the box, you know, <clears throat> even, you know, with his back to goal. If someone needs to turn fast and react quicker than everyone else, Gabby Dini seems to be able to do that, wh wh which is why, you know, you want someone who can get the knockdown, you know, if we're going to have, you know, players like James Will Prowse or Josh Sims or Redmond knocking in the crosses, then it seems to make sense to have the big man, little man combo. And I thought for a brief, beautiful moment there, I mean, Gabbiadini came on in the 82nd minute, so he had eight, ten minutes to get his goal. He did that really, really well. And I thought they linked up really well. And he, I would have thought uh, Pellegrino would have been looking at that and thinking, Right, so that worked really well for the last kind of like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I mean, he, he made all the changes after Ashley Barnes scored. And for the last 20 minutes, 
We looked pretty effective. And we had a goal which looked like a good footballing goal. You know, It came from good play from the midfielders, good cross, good knockdown, great finish. Um, and it, it seemed perfect. So, I mean, it just bemuses me that you know that's not something that, that we've tried before or, in fact, even since. Um, I won... On, on your point about the substitutions as well, we've spoken a lot all year about the in-game management and substitutions, the decisions that the manager makes. He makes these decisions and everyone goes, well, you know what? He brought on Gabriel Dean and Gabriel Dean scores. It's a good decision. Like, the way he'd set the team up and the way the team played, that he had no option apart from bring on, because we were 1-0 down. He had no option apart from to throw on another forward. So you kind of want to give him credit, but at the same time, it's it's not rocket science. That's our best goal scorer. Get him on the pitch and he will score goals. Well, and that's the thing. You want to see that game from the start as well. And you know, my question that uh, I've got for you really um, for this, and you've already started to answer it, is Pellegrino too reactive as a manager? I think he just, I think he lacks the initiative to go for games at the start, set up the team, set out to win. And it's only when he hits the panic button, when he's under pressure, um, that he actually seems to suddenly change the team into a way which which can score goals, whether it's an equaliser against Burnley, whether it's you know the amount of extra chances we we created against Stoke City. You know, why why is it that we can't see the Saints of the second half against Stoke City or the Saints of the last twenty minutes against Burnley for a full game and from the start of a game? It, it's weird because he's obviously he's like tragically conservative, isn't he? I mean, like we've got these games; they're winnable games. We are in make no bones about it. We are in big, big trouble. We are sleepwalking into relegation. I've no doubt about that, and we can't do it from the start. We are so dogmatic with this formation and this approach to games. And what I don't understand is this isn't something that's working for us. This is not like something that's worked for us for two thirds of the season and it's suddenly gone a bit wrong. This has not worked since day one. The teams we beat have been in dire, dire straits when we've managed to get results. We've not beaten anyone good this season. We've not beaten anyone that is better than us or that was there, that was playing well and we turned them over. Make no bones about it. None of our wins have come from us playing particularly well. And what I don't understand is he perseveres with this formation. It's not working by any metric. Goals scored, goals conceded, games won, points won. It's not working. And, you know, every week we trot out this insane repetition of same formula. And I don't know what it's going to take to change. Um... So one of the interesting things about what you've just said there, I mean, the, you basically just describe a manager who is either unwilling to learn or incapable of learning. Yet every single post-match interview, Pellegrino seems to come out with, oh, we're still learning. I mean, it, it does seem totally insane, doesn't it? I mean, uh, we, we know full well that they're not going to sack Pellegrino before the end of the season regardless of what happens now I mean you, you don't stick to it this late despite everything and you know there has been a slight improvement I think in, in terms of the performances but you know n nowhere near the kind of like step up that we need to see nowhere near the kind of transformation that Swansea have had under under Carvajal um, I'm going to go to a, another piece of listener correspondence here which is from Jason Dickey uh, he lives over the other side of the pond and the Burnley game put him over the edge. This was the most lackadaisical attack I've seen in several weeks. I know Burnley don't concede many, but come on. There was nothing positive until the Josh Sims substitution. I have been watching a lot of soccer lately. Uh, just about every team has a player that can take the ball and get it to the middle of the field around a couple of players and start creative attack from outside the box. Southampton sprints down the sideline, taps it back and uh, you're back and forth for a couple of times and then lobs a mediocre cross with no one to receive it. Am I getting this right? Please let me know if I'm missing something or misunderstanding the strategy. Finally, Josh Sims is so awesome. I know why Tom always wants him in. Uh, the kid is aggressive and fun to watch. He made something happen. We need to score in order to do so. We need to swap Romeo with Hoiberg um, or the Great Dane or Bergie. Um, need to get out of the 4 2 3 1. So he's going 4 2 3 1 rather than 4 5 1 or 4 3 3. I think that's also probably true. Um, and go with Gabby and Carrillo up top. Well, 
you know, I think we're singing from the same hymn sheet here. And uh, keep sings, Sims, James Ward, Prowse, and Lamina in. Whatever formation lets those guys play together and get forward is the one that will let us win. Those are my two cents. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we love, I mean, I think Jossum's being injured uh, this season has is, is been a real shame. Um, I, I think we, we've got many players who flatter to deceive uh, and who kind of almost do things. Buffal, I think, is a classic. Redmond, I actually don't think is that bad at it anymore. Redmond actually does seem to have impact. Um, Sims is a bright light. And I, I wonder if this season, you know, we'd have been better off with someone like Sims instead of giving him the, the giving the chances. Certainly that I know he's, I know he was injured, so it's totally hypothetical. But where would we be? And we've said it before. Where would we be if Charlie Austin had played from the start? Where would it be if Hoiberg? Where would it be if a Sims had been fit? Um, it's it's all hypothetical, but we just we just persevered with players uh, like we persevered with Van Dyke. We didn't sell him. It, it's just insane what they've done. Persevered with uh, Fraser Forster as well. Yeah. You know, Lick and McCarthy's coming. He's done really, really well. Um, so, I mean, interestingly, I think uh, Jason's seen similar things to us in that Burnley game that at the end of the game, that looked like a team that, that you should have playing. He also kind of notes that James Ward Prowse has been playing really, really well. So, obviously, you're going to stick with him. You're going to keep him in, in the squad. I mean, maybe he didn't have a great game against Burnley, but, you know, he's scored a few goals. He's been fantastic on crosses. Brilliant um, with a set place. Um, and Gabby and Carigio up top. Totally agree. What? So, so what do we do? What, what, <laughs> what do we do in the next game what when it's... We did, surely we did that. Surely we did that, John, because it's so obvious... We must have done all those things. What did we do, John? <laughs> we, we set up with a four-five-one, or oh, <laughs> four across the back, and two defensive midfielders, three midfielders, and one up top. I mean, one thing that that we can say is he did have Josh Sims on from the start, so at least he noticed that Josh Sims was playing well. But again, I mean, I think we're just we're just desperate to see us try something different, you know. What was it that was it an Einstein quote that you know the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and over and over again, expecting different results? Well, you know what, Pellegrino, wake up! You know, Albert Einstein would probably be able to manage this football team better, and I don't know if he knew anything about football at all. Um, so, you know, we're obviously on to the subject of Saints nil, Stoke nil, um, another pretty disappointing result. I said at the start of this game. Um, for my little bit for BT Sports score on, on Saturday that I, I think this was our biggest chance of getting three points between now and the end of the season. Um, I still think that that's, that's the case. Obviously, we've only got one point from it. Um, we had 15 corners in the game, but James Will Prowse had been dropped. And I've got to say that, that the corners really weren't um, that threatening and Stoke seemed to, you know happy to give them away and the first half of football was just so 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 poor um, yeah. and you know that things definitely got better in the second half but again you know we should be treating these games like cup finals you know it's not about going out for a draw it's not about you know just okay maybe that's a bad analogy because if you avoid defeat in a cup final you've won the cup but you know you've got to go out and try and win the game you only get 90 minutes you don't get extra time and that first half was was just so so dire and i mean what what have you made of it from what you've read about the match what you've seen what you've heard tom i mean what, what's the general feeling about that saints first half I, w I was stuck on a train outside Roncorn, which sounds like some sort of hellish uh like uh universe to be trapped in but i don't understand how their away record is so bad. It's comically bad. Um, they would have loved a draw. And I just I just don't understand the mentality. He's seen what worked the previous week. They're there for the taking. Joint uh, team with the worst, joint worst away record in the Premier League. Um, and, and we go out there with this same conservative approach. And you've got Nathan Redmond taking corners, man. I mean, like, what? Is, uh, how is that even possible? that Nathan Redmond is taking corners. It's it drives you mad. And and to be honest, Saints were lucky, really, weren't they, to come away with a with a draw. Uh, you know, Stoke had some good chances and it drives me mad. I think the most notable thing of that um first half was probably 
the battle between Doof and <laughs> Wesley Hoot. Um, so, I, I mean, for those of you that haven't seen the highlights or, or perhaps not seen, didn't watch the match, um, quite early on in the game, Doof stamps on Wesley Hoot's foot, which is a really, really nasty thing to do. You know, you, you, it's, a, it's a horrible crappy thing to do it's, 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 it's similar to the Van Dyke similar to the Vardy on Van Dyke it, yeah definitely it's similar to the Vardy on Van Dyke we know Van Dyke was out for an awful long time um, <laughs> Wesley who clearly wasn't happy about it he gave Duf a shove but then later on there was a, a, an opportunity um, with a ball looping up towards Duf and Wesley Hoot just went straight through him just took him out mid-air and Duf landed badly. I mean, I'd, we shouldn't laugh about this, but you know, you kind of you never want to see a player get injured. But dot dot dot. I mean, he he was he was taken off. I think he maybe had a broken shoulder or dislocated shoulder, something like that. If you've not seen it and you are looking for some entertainment from someone wearing a Santa shirt, I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, he goes through him like a train, like he's not there, like it's it's some sort of weird thing, like. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the footage of Boris Johnson playing rugby against children. It's a bit <laughs> like that. Like, he just flattens him. And, yeah, I think Duve has got a broken arm or something. Or, which, yeah, we wouldn't wish on anyone except someone who plays for one of the teams that might stay up if Saints don't stay up. So, well done. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't wish it on anyone unless they were the kind of person that would go around stamping on people's feet. Now, Tom, you're looking kind of rather conservatively at yeah. your next beer. So, so we're on time for the next beer. We've got two options here. We've got 51st State IPA or we've got um, Rust Bucket, a rye ale. Now, I mean, I don't know which which you want to go for, Tom, but I don't mind either way. I'm quite happy to go for the Rust Bucket if that sounds a bit too weird for you. You've got the Samuel L. Jackson brew beer. I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go with the Rust Bucket because, um, yeah, why not? Uh, Rust Bucket sounds, uh, sounds interesting. So, you know, let's let's go with it. This is a Kinniger Rust Bucket. Uh, again, another Irish beer. So let's see how that goes. I think Tom, there was actually a theme with the box that they're all Irish beers. Oh, right. <laughs> anyway. If you want to get yourself a free box of beer, head to beer52.com forward slash saints. We're enjoying them right now. Um, let's get back to, so that's our halftime break. Second half of football um, against State. I actually think that Saints played really, really well in the second half. So, I mean, and it's probably going to be an unpopular view because I've seen the fallout on Twitter after the game. People are fuming. I've seen the fan videos on the ugly inside uh, video channel on YouTube. Um, so the first half, you know, we had two shots that were off target. The second half, we had 15 shots. Six of them were on target. Um, and we played well. And we should have scored. Um, we, we really should have scored from that second half. You're shrugging, so I'm going to hand over the mic to you again, Tom. I think that none of those shots were particularly good. And a player like Butland, who is real quality, real great, uh, shot stopper, you know, is is going to always get those. And I, you know, yeah, they were low, and yeah, but they were they weren't like he wasn't really stretching, was he? He kind of played within himself. And again, it's the conservatism, and it's the yes, we had chances, but why don't stand is why is Gabby Dini not on for the entire second half? Why bring him on after what sixty odd minutes? Um, I just don't get it. And then in the end, it almost become it was almost like a. Pellegrino had been like possessed by the anti because he had like we had about 18 forwards on the pitch um just you know throwing everything we had at uh Stoke but Stoke kind of just as far as I can I like just kind of rode it out and we're fine with it in the end yeah I, I mean I suppose my argument is is that in that second half um you know, we had loads, loads and loads of shots. I mean, Sofiane Buffon had that header right in in front of goal. I think any day you'd normally expect him um, to score that. Um, you know, I mean, maybe that was really the only chance that really was worth writing home about. I mean, Josh Sims had quite a few good chances where he was through on goal and perhaps, you know, a player with a little bit more experience might have been able to do some, something a bit better. But generally, I felt, the way we attacked and the way we pushed, um, you know, was a lot better. I mean, yeah, I mean, I suppose like Gabbiadini only got 21 minutes, Shane Long only got six minutes, Sofiane Buffao only got nine minutes. So, I mean, that's a bit too late really to be making your attacking substitutions to go out and try and win 
a must-win game and a, and a real relegation six-pointer. Yeah. This isn't the Stoke team of six weeks ago where they were getting battered you know, every single game. Paul Lambert has put a much more disciplined team out there for Stoke. And and to your point earlier, we had 15 corners. How many of them actually found you know, a Saints player? It did, from what I was listening to, it, it seemed like barely any. And um, it, you know, John, you were saying earlier you thought Stoke were just happy for us to have corners the entire game. Yeah, I mean, the the way that they were playing is, I think they realised that without James Ward-Prowse on the pitch, we don't really have a reasonable threat from the set pieces like corners, which, you know, it's, it's kind of depressing to watch. If, if James Ward-Prowse is a fringe player and he's not guaranteed on the team sheet, then you need to make sure that some other players on the pitch can take really effective corners. You need to make three or four players stay behind after training with James Ward-Prowse and do those repetitive drills over and over and over again until you know, if James Ward-Prowse is not on the pitch, that someone else can do a half-decent job at whipping the ball in the box. And it just seems ludicrous that that we're not going to do that. And then having seen us get so many corners and being focused, going down the line, trying it looked like we were trying to win corners it looked like Stoke were happy to concede corners and then you just ask the question well why didn't we have James Ward-Prowse on from the start yeah and also I I don't know I mean again this is the um I think again the conservatism of 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 Pellegrino is is Romeo um that's a home game do we really need two midfield destroyers when we know that Stoke don't commit a lot of players forward could we not have had Lamina and, and Romeo um uh, sorry, Lamina and uh, Ward Prowse. You know, the as I was listening to it, and God knows what it was like if you were there. It sounded horrific, but just every single corner cleared at the front post, or not, you know, not probably not even getting that far half the time. It it seemed to be really dire, and the booze at the end of the first half. Um, and you know, I I would never boo Saints, but I completely respect the right of, and and the opinions of people who do because it's just simply not good enough. Um, so I'm going to try and eke some positives out of this, okay? So uh, I thought Nathan Redman had a, a pretty good game, yeah? Um, yeah, Tom's nodding his head, he, he's agreeing with me there. I also thought Josh Sims was fantastic. All the time that he didn't have the ball, and so you, you would have only noticed this if you watched the whole match because it wouldn't have made it into the highlights, you wouldn't have been able to see it on the radio because that's not how radio works. Um... <laughs> stating the bleeding obvious there um, but all the time he didn't have the ball he had his face towards the ball he was showing for it he was pointing to his feet he was running around he was trying to make himself available so if he ever had the ball Josh Sims was always looking for it and as soon as he got the ball he turned around and he was running towards goal he was attacking it was so positive it was just like that is exactly what we've been missing. I just, I love watching him play because he plays with a kind of desire and passion and attacking forthrightness that if I was a good football player, that's how I would want to play. I'd want to be really, really positive and always really attacking. I mean, maybe Josh Sims is is the glimmer of hope that could somehow help drive us towards getting out of this. It'll probably be dropped for the next game, though. Yeah, probably Redmond or switch to the other side I Sims is great we've always been big fans of him I think you know, what you said there was no different to what you did against Liverpool in the semi-final of the League Cup where he just drove on and football you know I know nothing about football compared to the people who work in it but as I understand it from watching it for many years it's not a particularly complicated game and being direct is generally quite a good approach and we've got so many players that kind of fanny around with it uh Booth out and Redmond. Redmond is more effective, but we've got players who fanny around with it. Tadic is a fannier. Uh, and it's great just to have someone who's really direct. Uh, he's got to play every week. He's got that sense of urgency that perhaps we don't see in, in the rest of the team. Right. I, I mean, I think that's probably. I mean, we've taught. What, what can we take out of this? I mean, we said before when we met last a uh, couple of weeks ago that we had two must win games. Um, I asked you, you know, what what point, what points do we need to get from this? Would you be happy with four points? You kind of said no. You wanted to see six points from the game. We've got two points from these two matches, and it's not good enough. We'd have been better off being more gung ho, winning one and losing one. And actually, we can roll that back across the rest of the season. We've got thirteen draws in the Premier League this season. That's more than anybody else. That's thirteen points. However, 
let's say that we'd be more gung-ho, 50% of the time it had worked, 50% of the time it hadn't. Let's, conservative estimate, say we won six of those games and lost seven. You did the maths before. How many extra points? That, that's five extra points. And five extra points leaves us much higher in the table. And, and this is what we need to see. We need to see more urgency, more attacking prowess. I mean, what, what, we, what league are we trying to win? Is it the, do we want to win the best drawers in the league? What I don't understand is, how, are the, how is Pellegrino not looking? Is he seeing a different league table? Is he seeing a different fixture list? Does he think we are sort of one third of the way through the season? We're running out of games. And we have the hardest run in of anyone. Right now, uh, we shouldn't date these things, but we have Crystal Palace are beating Man United 2-0. Like, what on earth is it uh, if West Brom weren't so terrible we might not finish third from bottom we might finish second from bottom um, which is a phenomenal thing for, to happen and we are sleepwalking absolutely sleepwalking and you know John you've got that list of, of games we've we've drawn at home well, we've beat we've failed to beat at home so do you want to just quickly run through those so teams that we failed to beat at home this season and this doesn't include the, the big sides that we failed to beat which you know perhaps you'd expect but Swansea, Wolverhampton Wanderers, Watford, Newcastle, Burnley, Leicester. Not only did we fail to beat Leicester, we got absolutely rollicked by them. Huddersfield, Palace, Brighton, and now Stoke as well. I mean, that you'd look at all of those games and uh, Saints under... Kuman, Saints under Pochettino, Saints under Claude Puel. You expect us to win well over half of those. Yeah, and if you look at those games, I mean, even if we just take the Wolves game and start out, because we can say that's in a freak yeah, cup result, Swansea failed to score, Watford failed to score, Newcastle right, scored twice, Burnley failed to score, Leicester, I think, scored once, Huddersfield once, Palace once, Brighton once, Stoke failed to score. Like, how is that possible at home? You know, clubs are meant to, that is. That's where you're gonna. That's where fortunes are won and fortunes are lost, and, and we have just completely bottled it at home this season. I mean, it's been disastrous. I mean, do you remember when we beat Sunderland eight 0 Where's that ruthlessness? And where, where's that like fun in the in the games? You know, it, it's just so upsetting to look at that. I mean, if that was our running for the rest of the season, you'd you know you'd bet your house on us surviving. But like under this current team, you, you just just don't know what, what, what we can do. I mean, home, home has become worse than away for us this season. I, mean, I, I, I booked my tickets for, for West Ham away um, uh, this morning and I, I, I don't think I'll go to St Mary's. The atmosphere is toxic and it's rubbing off on the players and, um, and that's not a criticism of the fans who have made it a difficult atmosphere because I think that the club has bought that on, on itself. But um, what are we doing? Like, how on earth have we ended up in this way? And if you look, we've now got to go to Newcastle. We'll, we'll look ahead to the games, but it's not, you know, the, I don't know where we think, unless there's a dramatic change, you know, complete revelation change in our performances, we're going down. Um, and that brings me on to a poll which we ran on Twitter yesterday. So I'm just going to read you the results, uh, well, and the question, I suppose. So the question is quite simple. Will Southampton be relegated? This is day after. No, no, no. This, this is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, yeah, yesterday, basically, it started it. Um, and 828 votes, which is a pretty you know, sizable sample. Um, and 63% of the fan base think, yes, we will be relegated. 37% of the fan base think, no, we won't. Um, obviously, like being a majority doesn't necessarily mean that, that you're going to be right. I asked people to put their reasons down. We had a few interesting reasons. Um, Bobby says, does the pair shit in the woods? I, I don't know whether he voted yes or no, but... Um, oh, I'm it, works both ways. it works both ways, that one. Yeah. Um, uh, Matthew Mitchell says, I voted yes with a heavy heart. We simply can't score enough to get the wins. We need to stay up. Uh, the defence isn't too bad at the moment, but we don't create enough chances. And those we do, we don't put away. Um, Matthew clearly has watched a lot of Southampton this season, hasn't he? Yeah, and I, I was just thinking then, that if we, you know, you're right, the defence has got a lot better. Um, 
but e- even still, um, you know, we we do concede some silly goals, and uh, you know, Hoyt as culpable for at least two from direct errors this season, and you know, we we've conceded a few goals, but we've often been the sort of masters of our own demise, and um, but just get it. I mean, it's all it's obvious, isn't it? Like if you don't score goals you're not going to win games and as Pellegrino said after Burnley and you know with everyone in the world smashing their head against the wall like you know we need to be more efficient we need to be more clinical but where do we think that's going to come from I mean it's difficult to see where we where we're going to get the extra points that we need I think we probably need what like another 10 points minimum maybe maybe 12 more points and with it being so close and you know Palace are winning um, teams are picking up points around us. I mean, Palace's fixture list going in um, to the end of the season is, is is much better than ours. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people who said no, and they've obviously just saying, you know, they're, they're, they're listing all the same problems that we've talked about every week this season, really. Um, lots of people saying that Pellegrino should, really should have gone. Um, there's... You know, there's there's so many kind of things that, that we've got here. Um, Marlon here says, you know, voted relegation because we have six away games um, and only three home games, although we think that might even be a blessing in disguise. Um, and a lot of people just saying that they cannot see us scoring the goals um, that we need to get to, to, to stay up. And, you know, that's interesting. I mean, another comment that I saw, I can't remember who from, um, but mentioned that, they thought they were going to get relegated because we don't have Latis. And you look at some of those other great escape seasons that we had in the in the 90s. And yeah, I mean, we weren't a particularly great side, but we did know how to attack and we did know how to score goals. It was really the defence that was the main issue. Also, I mean, and if you listen, uh, one of the you know one of my favourite things we've done on the pod is we had uh, Neil Madison and Jason Dodd on. Uh, what was clear, they had a team of characters. Mm. Um, they might not have been the most talented, most naturally talented footballers in the Premier League. Certainly not the most glamorous, certainly not the most well-paid, but they were a team of battlers and they were a team of characters who fought for each other. Um, and in Matty, you know, leadership, uh, you know, I don't want to get philosophical, but leadership comes in many forms. Um, some people are the people that grab people by the scruff of the neck and, 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 and take them to do incredible things. Other people who are just people who lead by example. Uh, and Matty, you know, didn't run around, he didn't tackle back, but... It did the job, and and what would we give for a player now of you know of our of our creative and you know for people who are listening you can't hear me but I'm doing the inverted thing, our creative players to have one tenth of the impact that May has, uh, you know because that would be that would be three goals, one tenth of the impact, and Buffal's got two. Yeah, these these players aren't fit to lace his boots. No, no. <laughs> It's, it's getting a, it's all getting a little bit depressing now isn't it Tom I mean let's let, let's look at the table um you know we're we're right down there at the moment I'm trying to look at the table but my, my computer's not only wants to show us the top five which is you know problem with uh you know the Premier League interest um you know West Bromwich Albion I think we can say they're as good as down and you know it's the two teams that drew a blank together that make up the the bottom places if Palace maintain their win against um, Manchester United as they're leading at the moment obviously if you're listening to this podcast you know full well the result now (laughs) Um, but uh, you know that could well be the bottom three at the end of the season couldn't it you know Southampton Stoke and West Bromwich Albion I think lots of the teams around us would have seen that fixture, oh no, you know, one of Southampton or Stoke's going to end up getting three points. And the fact that we shared a point each, didn't score any goals, it does nobody any good, does it? A nil-nil draw. I mean, it makes the game against Newcastle absolutely massive, which is our, our next fixture. But, I mean, we've said that about so many of the games. But Newcastle, they're the team above us in the division. They're one point ahead of us. So this isn't really a game that Pellegrino can go out and try and draw because if he goes out and draws it well we're still in the relegation zone is it this has it been the whole thing that we've just been on this slow demise from mid-table gently for it's almost been like a parachuted fall down to the to the relegation zone i mean we've had impressive draws against manchester united and against tottenham hotspur we had that win against everton we had that win against west brom so there have been a few little glimmers of hope 
But has it been the fact that like it's never been so catastrophic, maybe with the exception of the, the game at home to Leicester, that we've been allowed to slowly sink? And actually, if we were in this position earlier on in the season, maybe, you know, we'd have done something a bit more gung-ho. Maybe we'd have changed the manager. Maybe Pellegrino would have changed his tactics. I wonder if it's, it's, it's your point exactly. I wonder if it's a bit like the, the sort of boiling frog experiment, isn't it? Where because we've just slowly simmered, we do, we, uh, you know, we don't really realise the trouble we're in. Maybe if we'd have lost five games on the spin, like a lot of other teams have done this season, maybe that would have been enough to, to spark a change. But maybe you're right. Maybe we've just kind of coasted and... You know, we've used it a lot and it's not particularly original, but this is this idea of we are sleepwalking mm. into relegation where no one seems to be particularly concerned. The manager doesn't seem to be particularly concerned. James Ward Prowse comes out and says, it's going to be, we'll be all right. Why? Uh, what, well, you know, what gives people the, 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 the idea that that's going to be the case? Um, they're playing against professionals who are fighting harder than they are. And teams that we thought were nailed on to go down and get turned over every week in Huddersfield and Brighton are showing a lot more fight and a lot more character and an ability to beat the big teams like, like Brighton did at the, at the, you know, yesterday against Arsenal, which we have not displayed a single iota of this season. So the club is sleepwalking and, and everything you hear from the manager and the lack of the lack of noise from the board and the management at that level is deafening and the players themselves are not really standing up and being counted. So it's worrying times. Um so that's our uh, that's our preview of Saints Newcastle. <laughs> but we can, we can win. Why can't we win? Like Newcastle aren't that good. That they we can win we can beat Newcastle. We just need to play the right team. You know, and we need to attack. And uh, you know, if you're going to go down, go down fighting. Let's not go down with this insipid four three three. Go down, lose a few games, but at least go for it. Well, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. I I tend to think that you know Newcastle, where you've got Rafa Benitez managing one side um, against Southampton, which is one of Rafa Benitez's proteges, and the other side. I don't think it will be an exciting attacking game. I think it's going to be a really poor quality Premier League game. It's probably going to be a championship quality game. Um, yeah. You know, the, it's, the kind of crushing inevitability of it is, is really quite worrying. Right, I'm going to go on to some listener questions, if that's okay with you, Tom. Love to. Um, so let's do this. We asked you all on Twitter to send in any questions you had for us. Um, and we do have a, a few questions here. Um, I wonder if we s start with the slightly tongue-in-cheek one first from Jason Dickey, long-term writer into the podcast. Uh, he says, which EPL club should I follow next year when the Saints get relegated? Asking for a friend. Well, there's two answers to this. Uh, one is uh, that you can't because you've chosen your team and you've got to stick with your team because your team's, that's it. But also, he's, he says EPL, he's in America. So once you go to the championship, you don't exist. So I would... Uh, he, I, oh, God, I don't know. I've literally never even thought about this before. Who would you choose, John? Um, you know what, Jason? If I were you, I would stick with Saints. Yeah. Um, with our current predicament, the good news is, you know, with us being in the championship, you won't be able to watch the, the games. So you won't be able to watch this dire football. And actually, then you can start watching the Premier League and just enjoying it for the quality of the football. There's nothing hanging on it. You'll be able to watch the Premier League and not have to worry about the way the, the results are affecting your side. So stick with the Saints. Um, carry on listening to the Saints FC podcast. We'll be back. Saints will be back in the Premier League. So don't learn everyone else's names and then you'll just uh, lose them again. We'll be back. Yeah, I mean, the worst thing you could do is kind of like transfer to a team like West Ham United. And then, you know, two seasons later, uh, West Ham get relegated and, and Saints get promoted. I mean, you, you just don't you just don't want to do that. Stick with the Saints. Listen to the Saints FC podcast. Read some of the fantastic bloggers um, that are out there on the Saints. I mean, Shirley Mush writes for St. Mary's Muse, fantastic writer. We've got Glenda LeCur on League um league one minus 10 we've got the archers road and you know th th that's proper hipster football following a championship team when you live in america we will be back in the premier league at some point 
Um, I promise you that. I don't know how long it will take. I don't think it would necessarily uh, be too long. We do still have a really strong academy. We have fantastic training facilities. And we're a big enough name to attract the right sorts of players um, if we drop down to the championship. So stick with the Saints. Stick with the Saints FC podcast. We'll keep you updated on, on what's going on. Um, Matthew, Dev says, has Tom been converted into a craft beer loving saint yet? I'm on the way. On the way. Next update, two weeks, could well be. I'll have a like a, an accordion, a bigger beard and stuff, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, Guarney Cardboard Box Making Champion 2018 says, who are going to be the bottom three this season? Should we? W- I think we can both give an answer to this. Tom, what, what do you reckon? I'll bring up the league table again so you can have another look at that. Who's going to be your bottom three? Uh, I think you're going to... I think after tonight's Crystal Palace game, you'll be looking at the bottom three. Um... Has the game finished? Because the table's... Uh, my game is still ongoing. Yeah? Because yeah. um, it looks like Crystal Palace are now back in the bottom three. They're, they're, they're winning 2-1. They're winning 2-1. Um, I think I think it may be 2-2 two, two now, Tom, because this table tells me it's live. Um, in which case, the bottom three, as we speak at the moment, is Palace, Stoke City, West Brom. I would s- sincerely yeah. love it. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, Jason, this absolutely proves my point. We're here supporting Manchester United against Crystal (laughs) Palace. That is all sorts of wrong. If Saints weren't in the Premier League, you could just enjoy every Man United loss as much as you should enjoy every Man United loss. The fact of the matter is, we're supporting um, Palace, uh, we're supporting Man United against Palace. I was supporting Liverpool the other day because I wanted them to beat whoever they were playing against. Um, I can't even remember now, but it was an important game. These are things I don't want to do. I don't want to be supporting Liverpool and Man United and Chelsea in matches in the Premier League. Reed and Gao and Kruger and Pellegrini, you've driven us to this. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I sincerely hope that will be the bottom three. Oh, Palace, Stoke, West Brom. I like the sound of that. I mean, the dream, the the absolute dream Um and I take no real pleasure in any club getting relegated, but West Ham. Oh, West Ham would be the dream. And then, well, they're only two points off. Could happen in free fall. Uh, yeah, that would be the dream, West Ham. So I think the craft beers um, and, well, and also the Man United equalisers make me feel a little bit happier. But maybe we can go out and beat Newcastle. Maybe we can go and beat West Ham away. And then, then you could actually choose your bottom three from West Brom. I think Stoke are going down. I don't think I saw anything from Stoke that would suggest that they're going to stay up. So I'd say West Brom and Stoke. And then, I mean, maybe Newcastle. I just don't think... If you look at Newcastle's squad versus the rest of the Premier League squads, I don't think it's very good. And maybe in the end, the quality will show through. I think Benitez is a better manager than most Premier League managers, um, probably outside of the top six, certainly. Um but I think maybe maybe Newcastle could be the other victim. But is it? Are, are we always getting too hung up on this about the quality of the squad? We look at the Saints. Quality of the Saints squad should be nowhere near where we are now. Is it more about togetherness and fight and spirit and and players putting themselves on the line like you've seen Brighton and Huddersfield do so many times this season? You do wonder if if that's really more when when you're at this elite level of athlete. And yes, there are a few that will stand miles away like Messi and Ronaldo. Most of them, 98% of them, are just probably very much similar to each other. It's just probably how much they want it more. And I, I wonder if, you know, when we get to this elite level of athlete, that's generally what it comes down to. I, d- I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't necessarily agree because you look at the way the top six hoover up the best players from all the other clubs. And I think ultimately, you know, Saints lost a couple of players to Liverpool, and you know we we finished above them mm. after losing a few players to Liverpool and replacing them with you know some other pretty good players. But ultimately, in the end, quality will show. You know, Liverpool are in the Champions League. Um, you know, they're doing really well with Klopp, um, and and the quality of their players is quite you know plain to see. They do have vulnerabilities in other areas. I mean, Manchester City have got the perfect balance of incredible quality on the pitch and an incredibly, you know, meticulous and really good manager. And I, I mean, I, d- I, ta- I definitely take your point on the fact that maybe it's not all about the players, and I don't think it is all about the players. I think the manager has a huge, huge influence. You look at the top six 
the big six clubs in the Premier League, and they all have really big name managers. You know, really interesting managers with really impressive track records. And you know, you look at the rest of it, and it's people just trying to kind of cut their teeth and, and try and you know fight fight against in you know in a very uneven pyramid of football. Well, they're, they're all play- people trying to get one of those top six jobs, aren't they? You know, like, like uh, they're all trying to do a Pochettino. Yeah, Pochettino is the blueprint, isn't he? Come to England, do well, get a big job. And, you know, that's what they're all trying to do. Yeah, I wish Pellegrino <laughs> was trying a bit harder at that. <laughs> um, Chip Eater says, is anybody at the club on fire? I don't even really know what he means about is that. A, is this a Will Grigg reference? The Will Griggs on fire. I always thought that... Um, because I'd never heard Wigan fans sing it. I always thought Will Griggs on Fire was to the tune of um, uh, she's the, That Girl's on Fire by the Kings of Leon. And it's not. It's Free From Desire by Gala. And I just assumed it was Kings of Leon because I'm a hipster. But it's can not. You, can, you, um, can, you sing, <laughs> can you sing how it goes? What, the Will Grigg one? He goes, oh, I just get it. Goes, it goes, Will Griggs on Fire. Did it, did it, did it, did it. But I always thought it was like, yeah, Will Grigg is on fire. <laughs> so that's just, that's some idiot. Um, we'll promise to have no more Tom Parker's <laughs> singing <laughs> sessions. <laughs> um, so, uh, William Porteous Blythe, uh, our pirate, yeah. um, also producer of the Limehouse podcast, which is a politics podcast. He says, if we can't score goals with Buffal, Long, Tadic, Carige, Redmond and Lamina all being involved in the game, then what hope do we truly have? That's nearly £100 million worth of players. I mean, my first response to that is like, is £100 million worth of players with that many players enough in the Premier League? Also, like, none of those players are prodigious goal scorers. Buffal is two what two goals, three goals last season, two goals this one. Long one goal this season, um, half decent season last season. Creo f- seven goals for Monaco. Red- Redmond six goals last season. Uh, you know, none of these players they're, they're not goal scorers. They play offensive games, but they're not natural goal scorers. No, I mean, we need to fit Charlie Austin or, or someone else who can bang in the goals. Uh, Caroline Emerson uh, writes and she says, should the club's offer of a small group of fans meeting and talking to the club a few times a year be only about off-the-pitch subjects? Um, with the way things are going, shouldn't it include discussions um, about the pit on the pitch or a fans forum you know, potentially being... Being nice to say, I mean, I think Caroline is picking up on the fact that Saints were advertising for fans to apply to be on a fans forum or a kind of like a question group to to speak to the board. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I I don't necessarily know how much you get from meeting the club. I think in those sorts of things, they're always very very closely managed. I mean, I think back to when I went down to. You know, to the training ground and met Pellegrino and played against the the training staff and yeah it was a really cool experience but we were very very closely managed and I imagine you know the the same would would happen in in this sort of situation I mean you do corporate PR Tom you know more about these things what 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 do you reckon well members of the public are an unknown quantity journalists are in some ways are quite easy because journalists need access so journalists kind of have to play by an unwritten set of rules not that that would ever cower you john into stopping what saying what you think uh but members of the public and fans in particular uh are, are an unknown quantity they are they're a powder keg and i think that if you did have that kind of forum realistically like what does anyone think it's going to achieve fans are going to get to stand up and vent Arsenal have had this kind of forum for years and all it does is generates negative headlines of lack of investment, lack of spending in the squad, bad management, Arsenal betting the house on uh, building a bigger ground and not seeing that actually the money in the future would come from TV revenue. So I, I think it would be a good thing to do. But look, the club know how fans feel. The club know that they hear it at half time against Stoke. They, they, they've got people monitoring the social media feeds. You look at when when Saints tweet something like you know nil nil final result you know stalemate at St Mary's, the react the responses they know that they know the depth of feeling. I don't know what it would achieve apart from increasing more division. Yeah, I mean, 
I guess he, even the gesture would be nice. So I get I get where Caroline's coming from. That you know it would give some sort of sense that the club you know do care they are willing to listen to fans i don't know if it would actually ever change anything you know necessarily and and it's interesting about how you know the club wants to, to set it up to talk about off the pitch subjects i mean ultimately fans don't care that much about what happens off the pitch I mean, it's nice to be able to get like a reasonably priced beer and a half decent pie and um, you know, sit in a chair that's not falling apart or whatever and be able to go to the toilet at half time. You know, those are all things. But essentially, we're all there because we want to see Saints win. And um, if, we win. If, you, if we win, no one cares about any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think I think this is the kind of thing that you need when, you, know, you, you or you feel like you need it when things are going badly because you just want to shake Les Reed and Ralph Kruger by the shoulders and scream in the face like, what the hell are we doing? You know, what was going on? Which is exactly what Matthew Markstone <laughs> wanted yeah. to ask us. What the hell are we doing or what are we doing? He didn't have the uh, the, the hell in there. Um, you know, you could substitute hell for any number of four-letter <laughs> words, I think, um, um, for that. But, you know, you know, what what are we doing? What What is going on at the club? And I think that's exactly what most people would want to say in that sort of fan forum is just what on earth is going on? Um, let's try and finish on a cheerful thing. Say Saint Mike B writes it and he says, reasons to be cheerful. What hope is there for us? It feels like we're doomed, but maybe you guys can put a positive spin on things. And then says, good luck with that one with a cheeky smiley face. Reasons to be cheerful. We've got a really good team. Believe it or not, like they've got still got very, very good players. We've got better players than most teams in the Premier League. If they can be managed and motivated right, they can still be a hell of a team. Other reasons, still got some quality youth players. Hesketh, Sims, uh, Stevens, good, good quality players. Other reasons, we go to Newcastle. We win. After that, we've got an FA Cup quarter final against Wigan. We can beat Wigan. You know, we could come back to you in two weeks' time, right? This is the crazy roller coaster world of football. And we could be one defeat in what would it be like 13 games or something in total. Longer. You know, beating Newcastle, so up a, up a couple of places in the league and in an FA Cup semi final at Wembley. There's some reasons to be cheerful. I mean, can you, ma- if, if we manage to survive relegation and get to the Cup final? They will look back at these podcasts. You know, this man can think, bloody all this misery <laughs> that we had through the season. If we, I mean, if we won the FA Cup, which let's say maybe we have a one in eight chance of at the moment. I mean, Man City are out. Any other team can be beaten on the day. Um, yeah, to- I mean, Tottenham we drew with, Man United we drew with. So it's, it's not out of the realms of possibility that we could beat either of those two sides. Um, also, we've got to get past Wigan first. We do have better players than Wigan. I mean, we've dis- discussed this before. I don't necessarily think we have better manager. I don't think we ha- have necessarily more desire. But we do definitely have better players. We should be very cheerful about being the quarterfinal of the FA Cup. We should hopefully progress to the semi final of the FA Cup. And if it stays 2 2 in the Palace Man United game, then we'll, despite all of the misery and lacklustre performances and lack of wins and lack of goals, we're still actually outside of the relegation zone, even if it is just on goal difference. And we still have games left, which we could possibly win. And in fact, Manchester United have scored. So there we go. Uh, Man United are beating Crystal Palace. You already know the result if you're listening to this because the game happened in history. Give Pellegrino Pellegrino a new contract now. (laughs) Um, I think Tom is uh, tongue in cheek there and enjoying his uh, free beers there. Um, but yeah, there could potentially be a lot of reasons to be cheerful. If we beat Wigan, we get through to the semi-finals, get through to the final of the FA Cup, then absolutely we can be very, very cheerful about that. If we survive relegation, I think we're all going to be relieved. Um, and it will feel good to survive relegation, you know? Which which is the crazy thing. It, at the end of the season, if we survive relegation, most people are going to feel good about it. And then we go again. You know, we, we rebuild. We've got a lot of deadwood in the squad. I think that's been quite clear this year. And I think we'll see a lot of players leave. We'll see some people that, uh, if they don't leave, they'll certainly make a less of an impact, like Stephen Davis, uh, hopefully moved into a coaching role. Um, but I think, you know, we need to see, I think we need a real shake-up. And maybe, you know, if we do stay up, maybe flirting with this relegation 
in the long term will be a positive. Um, so there we go. That's it for the Saints FC podcast uh, this week. Do remember, if you want to enjoy some delicious craft beers like myself and Tom have, head to beer52.com forward slash saints. Also, make sure you book your tickets for an evening with Matthew Letissier at Revolution in Southampton on the 22nd of March. It's a Thursday evening. What else are you going to be doing watching Arsenal in the Europa League? No, I don't think so. So, yeah, go and get your tickets for that. Go and sit down, have a drink and listen to you know, the greatest football player that's ever walked this earth, talk about football and, and his stories about Saints. Absolutely, why not? Um, next week, hopefully, we're going to be inviting a rather interesting chap to the to the sofa. Um, he said he's going to be coming, so if all things work out, we're going to have Duncan Alexander um, from Optus Stats um, with us. Uh, we'll be slightly later. We'll be recording on Tuesday rather than on Monday. Um, but hopefully... Uh, we'll have Duncan Alexander. Apparently, Southampton have been a statistical outlier, so we can delve uh, into that. Um, as always, let us know what you think about the podcast. We're on Twitter at SaintsFC Podcast. We're on email, SaintsFCPodcast at gmail.com. Send in your questions for us. Send in your questions for Duncan Alexander of Optus Stats. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see you soon. And hopefully next time we meet, we'll have three points on the board. Three points in a FA Cup semi-final place. Good night, everyone. Cheerio.